I'd like to welcome all of you to the Cato Institute for a special live episode of Libertarianism.org's Free Thoughts podcast. I'm Aaron Powell. I'm director of Cato's Libertarianism.org project. And I'm Trevor Burris. I'm a research fellow at the Cato Institute Center for Constitutional Studies. This is a, the first time we've done it here, uh, live streaming. We've done a couple live episodes before. And uh, <clears throat> Free Thoughts was started about 4th October of 2013 when Aaron and I decided that we needed to have a, a podcast that got more in depth into libertarian issues and actually asked the difficult questions that people really want to ask libertarians. So rather than putting someone like Michael Cannon, who's the director of health policy at Cato, into the chair and saying, tell us about uh, section 209G of some law that's coming up, we wanted to ask Michael, uh, what about people dying in the streets? Because that's the kind of questions that people want to ask libertarians and to get in-depth to the ideas. So we're excited you're here today to see a, a, a live taping of a Free Thoughts podcast. And we're pleased to have Tom Bell as our guest today. He is a professor at Chapman University's Fowler School of Law, and he's here to discuss his new book, Your Next Government, From the Nation State to Stateless Nations. Welcome, Tom. Thank you, thank you for having me. So this is a book about the evolving nature of governments, about how governments need to evolve and to compete to better serve us. But that raises a question, and it's one that doesn't actually get asked a lot when we're talking about policy, when we're talking about government systems, about how these things should be set up, how they should operate, and that's what's the purpose of these things in the first place? Like when we say they should better serve us, they should do a better job, what is that job? The job of government? Yes. Hmm. Uh, well, let me first say thank you all for coming and to hear about my new book, Your Next Government. And I, I think Friends of Liberty will find it especially interesting because it describes this revolution currently sweeping through the world of government from the bottom up and the inside out all over the world. And it shocked me when I did the research for the book. I didn't, I didn't know about this until I went and gathered the facts. And as far as special jurisdictions go, their job is to help governments do their job. Now, what governments are for, you'll get different accounts, but I would say generally, to uh, refer to the Constitution, it's to promote the general welfare, secure the blessings of liberty. That's the Declaration of Independence. I read them together. They taught me this at Cato, where I used to work as integral documents. And special jurisdictions help governments do that by setting aside small areas where you can try out special rules. When I was at Cato, I discovered, well, it's the way we did business. We were always aiming at reform sort of an inch deep nationwide, which is worthwhile. But when you do that, it gets everybody in the country kind of alarmed. And the beauty of special jurisdictions is it allows you to go narrow and deep. So in a little area, you change the rules a lot. If it doesn't work, it allows the government to try somewhere else. So it allows governments to give us more options in choosing the form of government we want. That's good for us. In the long run, it's good for government. It makes them more adaptable. They can serve we, the consumers, of government, government services better. Do you make a distinction between government and governance? Some, some people do. I don't know if you do. I don't, I don't have a, you know, a hard and fast rule, but uh, I, I do prefer to talk about governance because really what we should be thinking of is the governing services industry. You think about the postal service, right? They deliver mail. Well, so does FedEx, UPS. They deliver things too. Well, we should look at government the same way. There's the federal government. State and local governments, they provide governing services, but you can get the same services in a private community frequently. Not everything, you're not gonna get an ICBM from your HOA, <laughs> but as far as like securing your property, uh, allowing you to move freely in public areas, all the good things that we like from our local governments, you can get that from an HOA. At the start of the book, you make a point that we think about the question of what makes a particular nation rich. Um, a lot of us point to natural resources, we point to maybe innovation or technology, but you think that that's wrong, that it's in fact the rule of law. I would have said what you're saying, Aaron, again, before I did the research for the book. If you would have asked me, you could ask yourself now, what's the major source of wealth in the world? I think most of us probably think initially, kind of silly, but we go to like, oh, I don't know, diamonds and gold? No, probably not. Real estate? Maybe uh, corporations, you know, the shares of corporations, maybe. No, nah. it was the World Bank, the World Bank that convinced me otherwise because they did a big study, a whole book about the sources of wealth. Very curious. I put together a chart in the book. The book has several charts, which I can't share with everybody here now by the book. 
<laughs> but the World Bank gives this information in their book, and they never put it on one page. If uh, Scholars will note, I had to cite two sources to put it together. Here's the short of it. The biggest source of wealth in the world, according to the World Bank, is the rule of law. 44% of the wealth in the world, the single largest source of wealth in the world, is the rule of law. And even I, who work in the law, didn't understand that at first. So here's a thought experiment to illustrate why that is very plausible. You might have heard about the neutron bomb back in the day, the Reagan administration. The idea is if the Soviets invaded Eastern Europe, we would explode these neutron bombs above them, and it would kill the people with radiation, but they're clean bombs, relatively speaking, and it would leave the buildings and the roads and everything else. I mean, it's still killing people, but it's better than leaving a, a burning radioactive wasteland. Well, imagine we could create a law bomb, and you explode this over a city. It doesn't kill anybody. It doesn't destroy any property but all the laws are erased. So imagine you did this over New York City. New York City, big source of wealth. Some terrorist explodes a law bomb, and people wake up the next morning. What would that be like? It would be very bad. Most of the wealth in New York would be boom, gone just like that. Oh yes, there'd be buildings and cars and diamonds, but that's not the real source of wealth in New York City. People would wake up and they'd go, uh, what am I gonna do today? I don't have a binding contract to go to the office. Maybe I'll stay home. Oh, but wait, I got all this stuff here, and I don't have any protection of my property rights. I better get out of here. Oh, wait, I better stay here and lock the door. I mean, it would be a mess. It would be utter chaos. People would flee New York City, and if the effects of this law bomb continued, it would be a vacant wasteland. We can't live without law. I have to stress this for my libertarian friends. Actually, humans love rules. We are <laughs> rule-following animals. What libertarians should stress, and I think most of them are good at this, especially Cato, is not, let's not have any rules, but rather, let's choose our rules. And that's really what this is all about. Making government a service industry so we have more freedom of choice so government can get better. Does this book represent, because you worked at Cato, you worked in the policy world, you, you've done things to try and make government better, but are, are you kind of giving up in terms of Make it, working through government, say, do a better job uh, in trying to get out of the system? And I guess a, a secondary question to that is, if that's so, why aren't governments getting better? Oh, I think governments are getting better, actually. I'm kind of, you know, I have a, I'm con a congenital optimist, maybe. So you can discount this as, oh, Tom's just a happy guy, lives in Southern California, gets a lot of sunlight, whatever. <laughs> but I really do think governments, indeed, if I want to push the point, the world generally is getting better. But I've not given up on traditional approaches. In fact, I'm going to the Hill after this meeting uh, to talk to some legislators, I guess, who are interested in some reforms. That's not really what I do, though. Uh, we need a diversity of approaches to reforming government. Keep sending in your money to Cato. I just sent them my yearly donation, end of December. And it's important to try to get reform an inch deep and a mile wide. Sometimes it works. Sometimes it does. I, I helped get rid of the ICC back in 96. It happens. But that's not where I think my services are best applied. I think it, we also need people like me trying to create these small areas with deep reforms. And, uh, and I think governments are very receptive to this. Again, it shocked me. I started researching this book. There's uh, over 200 foreign trade zones in the United States where the federal government has said, hey, in these little areas, no customs and duties. And it's not like people said to the federal government, we have to have this. They did this in the, uh, it was after the Smoot-Hawley Act, because they realized, oh no, we just choked ourselves off from international commerce, said the federal government more or less. We better actually institute some liberalization in small areas. It's the same thing with other, think about, I've been working in Honduras and French Polynesia. These are all places where the governments have said, we want to bring in foreign investment, we want to offer our population better forms of government. We don't want to reform, we can't reform the whole government, let's try a small area at, at once. So yeah, we need governments, governments are actually very receptive to this, in fact, I'll say to my libertarian friends, you should, not get, you should look at this area of reform. Sure, keep trying that inch deep, mile wide stuff. It might work, but check out this new strategy. It might get you places that the old strategy won't. So what I've, one of the things I found really interesting about this book was you start with examples of this in action with special economic zones and, and these other real world, we're doing these things, here's competing governments or smaller governments with different rules, but then you, you take a step back and you show how these examples and the value that, that these efforts have is based on a really interesting and I think powerful f 
theoretical framework for understanding what they're doing. It's not just that we're, we're doing something willy-nilly, but that there's, there's some meaning and ideas behind that. Um, and so I wanted to ask a bit about that, and I wanted to start with the, the idea, if you could tell us a bit about monocentric versus polycentric law and how that plays into the, the examples given in the book. Sure. So these are the kinds of things academics talk about. The question is sort of what's the, the big theory behind this. Um, this is not the kind of thing lawmakers think about much, and I think we should all be relieved about that. <laughs> but we academics and those of us here, we can think about this. Monocentric law, it's just a term used in the book. I didn't make it up, but it's the idea is we have one source of government. This is traditional defense of, it goes back to Hobbes, of the nation state. We have to have one authority to iron out conflicts between people. Otherwise, everyone will be at loggerheads. They'll settle their disputes with feuds. So it's nice to have a single sovereign over everyone who specifies a law and says we're going to use a metric system and we're going to have property rights and you're going to bring all your complaints to our courts. That's one approach to government at an extreme, just one sovereign. Um, and then at the other extreme, polycentric law is basically many competing sources of authority, often overlapping, all of which together combine in any individual's life to govern their, their behavior. And I would argue we live, we, we tend to think that we live in a monocentric government. It's very simple. That's the way the media presents the law to us, you know, federal government. They talk about the president running the country. It's absurd, but it's simple. That's the way we often think about government. But if you really look at the way you live your life, especially in America, there's many sources of law that govern your behavior. Of course, you have local, state governments also regulating your behavior, but that's not the end of it. If you really take the law broadly, as I do, you think about it as really it's the process of governing human behavior through rules. And that includes things like churches. Do churches govern behavior? Are they a source of law? I would say yes, in a very real way. It could control what you eat at lunch today in a few hours. That's basically governing your behavior. So we have, or you're in the Cato building, and they say there's a sign here, don't bring food into this auditorium. Kind of like a local law for Cato. So there are many rules from many sources that every day really govern our behavior. And the idea with polycentric law is let's notice that. Let's celebrate that. Find good things in it if there are. There's some bad things to it. You know, sometimes too many rules, they conflict, it creates chaos. We need to find a happy medium. So the idea is let's look at these extremes, monocentric and polycentric law. And in the book, I advocated for a third category of what I call it autocentric law. I think really at the end of the day, that's what we should want. Not, you shouldn't say, well, we got to have one king. Or we should have lots and lots of different rulers. I honestly don't know. The reason there's a question mark at the end of the title is I'm not, I'm not certain. Your next government? I don't know. It's for you to choose. That's what I see happening. We're getting more and more choice in government. It's a beautiful, wonderful thing. It's going to make us all better off. But it also means uh, we can't be certain what kind of government we'll end up with. Isn't it the case, though, that the, the kind of governing institutions like Cato or churches require that monocentric like umbrella thing above it? Because you could, I mean, I think most people would think that real polycentric law would be, which sounds kind of like anarchy, would be like Mad Max. You'd have the, the village with the, the bus that is the gate, and you have the village with the gyrocopter and all that stuff. And those are governed by different things, but there's no overarching thing that would actually rationalize disputes between them. Mm -hmm. And that's why we need the monocentric model. Well, again, that is, you know, that is kind of the story we're often told in maybe elementary, high school, even college, probably graduate school, actually. It's a little sad, but <laughs> this is not the way it works. I'll give you an example from the open ocean. So there's no governing authority. It regulates the high seas. And they are actually very rule-bound areas. For example, if you're, if you're sailing a flagged ship and there's a ship in distress and it sends out a call for help, under international law, you've got to go render aid. There's no sovereign standing in the background tapping its uh, baton on its palm, saying, you better do this. So why do ships render aid to each other when they're on the open seas? They're bound by international law and international companies that provide shipping insurance. And those international companies have said, hey, you want insurance from us, you're going to have to follow these rules. Oh, yeah, who's going to force it, the UN? No, we will. You want to sail with insurance? These are our rules. Now, it's true. I mean, if you look at their insurance clause, there's probably a choice of law and a choice of foreign provision so that there's a conflict. Maybe they end up in New York City and they apply maybe the rules of the ICID. But, you know, you could do that in private arbitration. You could do it in Venezuela. Oh, not Venezuela, actually. <laughs> Sorry, I was just I've been thinking about Venezuela lately. Let's choose a, a working country. Uh, uh, Germany. You can, 
So yeah, but it's, it's sort of arbitrary and not necessary. There's a lot of governance that happens without governments. That's the one reason I prefer governance. Then how does the notion of consent fit into this? Because consent plays a large role in your book. Um, and to a certain extent, your book is just, is almost like a call for more consent huh? in governance. How does this notion of having like one sovereign or lots of sovereigns relate to consent and, and how, why is consent so important when we're thinking about governments in the first place? You're a daring man, Aaron, to ask me about consent. <laughs> Because I have a background in philosophy, and, uh, and I risk running on a bit. I tried to keep it short in the book. I'll just say uh, I think consent is very important. In fact, I think after having debated this with many libertarians, you can make a pretty strong case that consent is and should be at the core of, of libertarian theory, and more generally, the theory of government generally. Because it's sort of, to me, an ultimate moral value. It's what you will agree to freely what you will consent to. So that is kind of um, a lodestar, a touchstone for governments, uh, governance. And I think we should, yeah, we should emphasize consent and we should try to make governments more consent rich. One thing I take pains to emphasize in the book is that too many people think of consent as an on-off switch. They think of it as a binary relation. You either consent, you say yes, or you don't consent and you say no. When you work in the law for years, as I have, you realize there's lots of gradations of consent. For example, this is an actual case. Doctors come across a man lying unconscious in the street. He fell off a streetcar in Cottenham versus Wisdom. They render aid. They go, he doesn't survive. But they go to the estate afterwards and they say, you should pay us because we rendered aid. Was there a contract? No, the guy was unconscious. Did they get paid? Yes, they did. Because there's this intermediary form of consent. The guy did not wake up and say render aid, but we say impliedly, or hypothetically, he did or would have consented. Probably here we'd say he would have consented. So the point I want to make is, as I describe in the book, it's a nice graphic for it, consent comes in different shades. So to some of my cranky libertarian friends, I say, you got to loosen up a little. <laughs> Too many of them say, oh, I never signed the Constitution, so it's not binding at all. Well, look, I'm sympathetic to that line of argument, but I just don't think it's realistic. And, and it locks you in this position where you have nothing to say about improving government. I didn't sign on the line. Not consensual. Not for me. Governments come in different flavors with different degrees of consent. And the goal is to kind of climb this ladder of consent. Recognize the imperfections of our government. I'm the first guy to do that. But don't give up on it. We can make government better if we keep trying to make it more consensual. And special jurisdictions, special jurisdictions can help us do that. Because when you move to a special jurisdiction, you're choosing to move there. When you're just born in the United States, as I was, I didn't really choose these laws. It just kind of, I stepped into them. So consent is a matter of degree, and more freedom in choice among governing systems can help us increase the amount of consent in our lives, and that is a really good thing. Is there a relationship then between the size of government, maybe in terms of its, its scope and powers, but also in terms of geography and consent? Because you said so, we have more consent if there's a, you know, a special economic zone and we can choose to move into it, but for a nation as large geographically as the United States, I mean, you, you mentioned, I think, Hume's criticisms of the like, love it or leave it notion of consent, that it's awfully hard to move out of the United States. You're giving up your career, you're giving up your family, you're giving up the culture that you know. So is it, does there come a point where basically governments become too big for meaningful consent to really function within them? That's a good question. Um, I would say there's a correlation, but it's a loose one. What I, I if, if I had a, a a blackboard, I would stand up and start charting this out, but I think there's a trade-off between size of government and how much government does. For example, I think most people could agree to a world government if it only did one thing and it prevented evil people from hurting innocent people. And maybe we narrow that in a little bit more. You know, you could say something like, no shooting of children. How's that? If that's all the government did, we'd feel okay about it. Whereas if it's a very small local government, suppose you live in a, a commune. They tell you what to wear, what to eat, when to pray. Not for me, could be for you. That's okay, it could be oppressive to me, but you chose that, you moved to that commune, that's fine. So it seems to me each type of government could be equally valid, but generally the larger governments, because governments tend to 
metastasize and grow too big. They tend towards doing too much. But it's not a problem with bigness per se. It's a problem with bigness combined with how much they try to do. We did this, though, with <clears throat> the American experiment. I mean, we could say that before that, we had very non-consensual governments. And we, since that, we've had many non-consensual governments. But what we did in America, we wrote a constitution uh, and then sent it out to the people to be debated by popular ratifying conventions, some of which had larger rules of suffrage than even voting at the time. Uh, and that was about as good as you could ask for uh -huh. in, a, in a realistic procedure to get consent. So why would we use the American model as, as sort of a model of consent in that, in that fashion? I'm a big fan of the American model. And I think, as you said, you said it uh, so well, Trevor. That was, you know, the, that was state of the art in its day. I mean, more than we realize. It's just amazing, shocking. You go back and you realize what the founders had as their precedents. And there was a little bit. They looked at the, the Swiss model of government. They actually looked at how the, the Iroquois and the Indian nations governed themselves. They looked at how the Covenanters, these religious groups, would get together and agree to their particular religious community's rules. But really, the founders did some radical stuff. Yay. But we can do better now. And so my libertarian friends who had this, this kind of hero worship of the founders, I get it. But... You know, I feel like they're kind of stuck in that era. You should take the spirit of the founders. Really, to me, they said, let's do as much as we can to make this government as consensual as possible. And wow, they did a great job. But we could do better. We could learn from their precedent. And we now have technologies that they didn't have. I don't know what they would do today, but I think if they were here, they would probably be very proud, probably also appalled <laughs> at what we've done with their experiment. But they, I think, would say, you know, let's keep pushing forward. Let's make an even more consensual form of government. I think that's possible and it would be a good thing. When you're talking about this, this spectrum of consent, so you gave the example of, you know, you're, you're injured on the side of the road, you're unconscious and aid is rendered to you. And so you didn't in, you know, any explicit way consent to it because you couldn't, but we'd, in that case, we give, say, call it like hypothetical consent. Like you, had you been able to, you would have. And so we can assume you did. Um, how does that, when we're talking about consensual levels of government, um, so you've rejected the kind of hardcore libertarian view of, I didn't consent to this, therefore no. It seems like hypothetical consent does a lot of work when we're justifying governments. Mm -hmm. um, but what role does explicit non-consent uh -huh. then play? Because governments don't say, so in the case of the rendered aid, had you been able to say, no, I absolutely don't want you to uh -huh. help me out, the, the people would have to respect that. But if I say to the federal government, no, I absolutely don't want you to give me social security or no, I absolutely don't want you to lock my neighbors up for smoking marijuana, mm -hmm. they still do it. And so it's hard to then hook that onto something like hypothetical consent because I've been pretty clear. Right, right. Um, wow, there's a lot to say there. I will say in the book, I also talk about negative consent. The spectrum of consent goes to the positive. Hypothetical consent is very weak. We say, well, you would have agreed to this, but I didn't. But you would have, but it, and it gets stronger to express consent. I agree to that. And it, negatively, you can say, too, well, I, you would never have agreed to that, would you? And you might say, well, I did. And you can have, you know, hypothet you can have non-consent expressed. So all this is on the spectrum. And I would say with regard to the conflict between hypothetical consent, you should like this government. You would have agreed to it and express non-consent. I don't like it. I think the express non-consent generally should win out. I'm going to say general here because I'm a lawyer. I like caveats. <laughs> if someone says, you know, the rule I don't like of your government is I don't get to steal stuff and hurt people. I don't agree to that. You'd say, well, you better scram because we don't want your type around us, civilized people. So there's limits to this. But I would say what we should try to do, since you're right, uh, you're, you're right, Aaron, that most of the time people use hypothetical consent to justify the jurisdiction of the United States. They just say, well, you know, you would have agreed. Or maybe implied consent, love it or leave it. I think there should be room for people to say, I want to opt out of that Social Security thing, not for me. I expressly don't consent. And our government would be more justified. This would make our government better, philosophically, not just practically, but we would feel prouder and better about our government. People could say, that's not for me. I want to opt out. And we should do that as much as possible. I don't know how far we can take this. I think Social Security. Certainly, that wouldn't be that hard to say to, you know, have people opt out. In many other areas, people should be allowed to opt out. So let's keep pushing that so people can express non-consent and have that really be effective. If we did that, it would make the remaining government more justified. 
we'd be more comfortable in saying, yeah, Social Security is a good idea because the people that are in it are here by choice. They didn't opt out. That's not what we have now. I wish we did. You make an interesting claim uh, when you discuss the Constitution, which seems to apply to pretty much every government on the planet, that you can treat those constitutions like, quote, a legal document that most resembles a standard form agreement offered by a large, powerful, unnatural person to its many relatively powerless individual subjects. Now, having been to law school, and Aaron also went to law school, uh, it's this sort of tr contractual uh, difference of uh, force and, and size of the parties, which creates a problem uh, in many contractual situations. It seems that when you talk about things like HOAs, which you bring up as a possibility of a form of government, and so you bring up Highlands Ranch, Colorado, which is right next to where, where I grew up in Parker, Colorado, which is a, in Highlands Ranch, which is just a massive growing blob of tract housing, and you kind of cite that as a private community. Mm -hmm. But I can guarantee that if you went up against the Highlands Ranch HOA, they would beat you into a pulp, uh, like most HOAs would. So uh, with that's the same, not literal. You don't mean I mean, literally. not literally beat you into pulp. Right, not literally. But you would not have pink flamingos on your yard. You would not be able to paint your house the color you want. Right. Uh, isn't the way to interpret an HOA contract very similar to what you say here? A very large group of thing against an individual, and we have this huge negotiating power differential, so we should invalidate those contracts too. Well, uh, you're asking a contracts, again, you yeah. too, <laughs> Trevor likes to take risks. He's asking a contracts professor <laughs> about uh, adhesive agreements. I'd say it's a question of degree. Um, it is true the HOA has more bargaining power, I guess, than a homeowner, although apparently there's a nice neighborhood right next door to Highland, Colorado. You don't like it. You, Highlands Rancho. Yeah, you, yeah. Can, you can just stay one mile away. So, you know, how much power do they have? But once you agree to those rules, as I understand it, I've lived in HOAs, they're pretty strict about it. You don't have the same choice, though, with regard to the federal government. You can't move one mile away and say, oh, no labor code for me, thanks. I'm just going to move, you know, over to Maryland where you don't have it. It just doesn't work that way. So it's a question of degree. But, I, but you're certainly right, and I'm glad you told our listeners and our audience about my approach to the Constitution. Um, basically, I think we should look at it in a way very much akin to the way courts already look at standard form agreements. If you sign a rental car agreement, you know, for, for something and there's some fine print in there or, you know, they ha you have a dispute with them, courts look at it very skeptically. They don't have as much skepticism, it seems, with, um, oh, that's right, their employer, the federal government. Federal courts don't <laughs> seem to be quite as skeptical about, and by the way, I bring that up because here's the thing. Let's go back to the rental car agreement. So this is a question of degree. Some of these standard form agreements are more oppressive than others. It depends on a number of circumstances. Any court would tell you this. But I just got to point this one thing out because it kind of makes me grind my teeth. Suppose you signed this rental car agreement with Hertz, say, not to pick on Hertz, but just Hertz rental car. And they had a clause in there that said, if you have any disputes with us, it's going to go to private arbitration. Okay, it's pretty standard. Oh, and the case will be decided by the CEO, CFO, and COO of Hertz. <laughs> no government court would uphold that provision. Any government court would say, oh, that is facially unfair. There is no way you have to go to that arbitration. Case closed. Bang. Next case. First Amendment case. You're suing the government? Oh, yeah, I'll hear that. <laughs> this is the same judge. when they, She looks at her W-2. It says U.S. federal government, and she is now going to hear the case against the federal government. I know what you're thinking. You're thinking probably the same thing Hobbes thought. We have to have an independent party to resolve these disputes, someone who's objective. Agreed. But it doesn't have to be the government. So here's my proposal made in the book. I call these citizen courts. Anytime you, me, anybody has a case against the federal government or state government, any government, it should go to arbitration, private arbitration. It shouldn't be in government courts. No government court would let the private sector do that, but they got a special rule for themselves. And if you're wondering how you do this, it's actually pretty simple. Suppose I have a fight with Aaron. He chooses an arbitrator. I choose an arbitrator. Those two arbitrators choose a third arbitrator. That panel of three judges is pretty objective. It's balanced. I don't know why we don't do this for cases against governments. I like to think it's because no one suggested it before. <laughs> Problem solved. <laughs> All right, so I hope you guys will hop on that. I'm an academic, but some of you make things happen. Please fix that problem because that's one reason the American experiment has kind of gone in the ditch. Courts have driven it there over many years because time and again, you got government employees deciding cases against the government and what do they do? Time and again, talk to some people here in the building who do con law, they'll tell you. The trend is bad and it's not getting better and it won't get better as long as you have that 
non-disinterested judging. The judicial power of the United States shall extend to cases and controversies arising under the Constitution of the United States and its treaties and statutes, so that's why we do it. Oh, that says the courts can decide the cases. There's nothing in there, I looked at that, that says only those courts can decide those cases. And indeed, federal courts often use arbitration. It's quite common in some civil disputes. In fact, many government systems say, please go take your, go try to mediate. Oh, you didn't mediate? All right, go arbitrate. They keep pushing off much litigation. Oh, but if it's a First Amendment case, it comes straight to the government court. I don't see why that's necessary. It's not in the Constitution. It's not good policy. It needs to be changed. So before we turn from theory to practice, I hope you can indulge me with one last theory question. Uh, namely, you, so you've advanced this, what you call your contractarian theory of constitutional law. And constitutional interpretation is an important thing. At Cato, we talk about it a lot. It's a big thing among libertarians. And so to get at what that contractarian theory looks like, I was hoping, could you maybe tell us a bit about how it's different from two of the other big schools that you discuss in the book, um, with originalism and living constitution? Oh, thank you, Aaron. <laughs> this is an issue on which I'm almost all alone. Most libertarians in constitutional theory are originalists. They think the way we should interpret the constitution when the language isn't plain, and it isn't always, is to go back and try to figure out what the people who ratified the Constitution thought it meant at that time. That is originalism, very popular among libertarians. It's a mistake, my friends. I'm here to set you straight. Let's set out the other school of thought. Libertarians have done this because they've only seen, you know, it's either originalism or this other thing, the living Constitution. Now, agreed, living constitutionalism is a total train wreck because what does that say? It says, what does the Constitution mean? Let's hand that over to some experts who wear robes on the Supreme Court. We're going to let these nine justices kind of look at their own institutional navel, their own precedents, and we're going to trust them to figure out this language. And somehow they're going to be in touch with what the people in the streets, <laughs> what the people in the streets <laughs> need and want and should have. And we're going to trust these justices to interpret the Constitution. That's living constitutionalism. That gets you things like, Gonzalez versus Raich, which said, you know, it's, it's in, the federal government has the power to regulate you growing and smoking your own dope in the privacy of your own home. That's interstate commerce. That is not consistent with the plain language of the Constitution, but there was Wickard, a Supreme Court precedent that led the court to say, well, you know, we have our precedent. We're the experts. We're going to be bound by that. So living constitutionalism, not so good for liberty, great for statism. Originalism, now what's my complaint there? I will admit, originalism is probably better than living constitutionalism on many issues because the founders were much more libertarian than the Supreme Court justices. However, it gets you in some very awkward positions. Justice Scalia may rest in peace when he was still living. He was a foremost originalist. He admitted in public, there's a clause, the Cruel and Unusual Punishment Clause, Fourth Amendment, that no cruel and unusual punishment shall be inflicted under the federal government. It's in the Bill of Rights. And someone asked Scalia, hey, Scalia, you're originalist. What does that mean? Well, it means what the founders thought it meant. So back then, they thought it was okay to lash people. That was routine criminal punishment. You put them on a post and you whip them. Is that cruel and unusual? So Scalia had to come out, honest man, bless his heart. He saw where his theory went. He said, yes, that would be constitutional under my theory. We're not sure what cruel and unusual means, so we're going to go back to see what the founders thought. They also thought branding was okay. You could brand people. Now, maybe some of you think that's okay today. I think most people in America today would say that is sick. There's no way we're going to do that. Originalism, Scalia said, yep, yeah, that's constitutional. It's stupid. He, he was quick to add. I'm not advocating that as a matter of public policy, but it's in the Constitution. So that's a problem with originalism. The founders didn't agree with us on many things. Contractarianism is the third better way if you're a friend of freedom. And it says, let's read the Constitution as we would, as close as we can, to a standard form agreement offered by an all-powerful, immortal institution, the most powerful institution arguably history has ever known, and it's going to be you and me as individuals against the federal government. That is not a fair fight. We know how we would read that contract offered by Hertz rent -A, a court would read it very skeptically. We should do that with regard to the Constitution. And when we come across a phrase like cruel and unusual, we don't go to the Supreme Court. They're well-educated. They're very rich. 
And then these days, they're held up like, you know, stars. They live in a different world from you and me. I don't trust someone who lives in Georgetown to tell me what cruel and unusual means. I don't think that's going to jibe with what common people think. And we don't go back to the founders. Great men in their day, long past, we got to do things our way. We should ask what cruel and unusual means to people who have to live under that rule. And it's better than originalism in this way, too. If you want to figure out what the founders thought, you got to go do historical research. And guess what? Historians don't agree. I'm sure there's probably a historian there saying, well, they didn't brand much. It really wasn't that common. Are we really going to have to have that fight? Let's not do that. We could do it very simply under contractarianism. You do a poll. You say, hey, all these people have to live under the Constitution. What do they think it means? Here's the test I like to apply, actually. Imagine you're an immigrant moving to the United States. You're not really totally immersed in this culture, but you can read good English, and you pick up the Constitution and read it, and you see cruel and unusual, you should be able to say, I know what that means. You shouldn't have to go read a bunch of Supreme Court opinions. You shouldn't have to do a bunch of historical research. You should be able to trust your gut. We should cut every, we should give you the benefit of the doubt. Cut the slack in your direction. So that is the third approach to constitutional law. Again, I haven't heard people advocate it for a lot. It's in the book, so libertarians, get on board. You're going to hack off a lot of my friends in the legal academy. But they'll learn. Originalism <laughs> is old school. This is a new, better way. Originalism we should is, adopt. Is definitionally old school. Uh, as, as, a, as an originalist, I, I, I feel that I have to defend it, but I, I'm actually going to move the conversation to more of the actual. Right. Uh, I just want to say I'm, I'm not, if anyone's mad that I'm like letting all that lie, we're going to move to the special economic zones and Honduras and Being other things. Being a gracious host, he's still an originalist. <laughs> um, He'll learn. <laughs> So let's talk about some of the things that are happening. So we've talked about problems with government, about reading government agreements that exist, about what happens in government, about the lack of choice and consent. Uh, what sort of things are occurring? You mentioned uh, fair trade, free trade zones. Uh huh. Free trade zones. Foreign trade zones. Foreign trade zones. So, so first of all, where like where is one? Uh -huh. I mean, it, it, would I just find myself in Salina, Kansas, and just be yep. like, wow, it's yep. a foreign trade zone. All right, so this is another one of those things I didn't know about until I started researching the book. The United States has a number of what we could call special jurisdictions. There's over 200 active ones, and they're called foreign trade zones. These are very common at all major ports and also in very obscure places. Every state, including landlocked ones, and Puerto Rico has a foreign trade zone because you can put them at airports too. What does a foreign trade zone do? Basically, goods coming into a foreign trade zone are not yet in the United States for purposes of customs and duties. These foreign trade zones are actually behind chain link fences, locked doors. They're kind of watched over by customs to make sure stuff doesn't go in and out without approval. But basically, I'll take, I'll take an example. There's, there's probably one in DC, but I live in Southern California. There's two of them in the LA area, the Port of San Pedro and the Port of Los Angeles. So you bring in a, a big shipment of bicycles from China on a big, uh, a, a big ship, uh, ship. And those, even though they are offloaded at the Port of San Pedro, are not in the United States for customs and duties. You don't have to pay any customs and duties. So you might put them on smaller ships and you know, send them down to maybe uh, Peru and send another ship over to uh, Canada, and you don't have to pay anything. You were able to bring those bikes into the country, maybe process them, add brakes and things, and ship them out again. That's great for purposes of trade. There's over 200 of these in the United States, and uh, that's just you know, example, there's other types of zones in other countries, but that one's close, close to home. So these zones are everywhere. You just don't see them. They're not talked about much, and that's what the book's about. What's the benefit to the United States government for setting those up or allowing those? Well, I think you could argue on net, and some scholars have, that it's on net actually not good. But the argument made for foreign trade zones is, and again, this was in the uh, wake of this, uh, uh, the, the acts at the beginning of the 1900s that clamped down on foreign trade, is to allow foreign trade more freely. Basically, it encourages you know, uh, trade. About oh, 600 billion uh, uh, in, in exports goes through these FTZs every year. About 6% of all exports in the United States go through FTZs. And the argument is, oh, look, we created this exemption for customs and duties, and there's all this, surprise, surprise, lower price, all this economic activity. And the longshoreman who works at the Port of San Pedro goes back to Corona where he lives, and he takes his paycheck, and he spends it, and the whole economy is made better. That is the argument. Now, the economists among you and policy wonks will see some holes in the argument, but that is a facially good argument for foreign trade zones. And they're very popular. No one really is criticizing them. Nobody even talks about them. 
Now, what about in Honduras? You've done work in Honduras, and, and there was one iteration of something even a little bit more, quote unquote, extreme uh, than a foreign trade zone uh, to free up uh, law and mm -hmm. enterprise and and you know, just making better zones for, for humans in Honduras, which is not a terribly efficient country right now. Uh, they have their problems. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm glad you bring that up, Trevor. There's a whole chapter in the book called Stories of the Sort Ordinarily Recounted Over Drinks. Because a cool thing about this area of law is it's gotten me from behind my computer and, uh, and out of my office and into the field. So I've been to Honduras, I've been to French Polynesia, I've worked with countries and parties all over the world interested in starting these zones. And it's a lot of fun, exciting, and interesting. Honduras has uh, written into law a, a provision for special jurisdictions that is among the most advanced, it's probably the most advanced in the world. They're just now starting to implement it. They were very close to implementing it when they had the recent uh, troubles in their most recent election, which right now is being resolved in the streets with riots. It's Honduras. It's a complicated place. But their ZA program on paper allows private parties to come into their country subject to oversight and never escaping the requirements of the uh, human rights protections Honduras on paper allows its citizens. The Honduran constitution continues to apply in these zones. However, these private parties in the zones can have their own civil law system, their own educational system, social security system. Basically, they can do their own government except for things like national defense, you still have to fly the Honduran flag. The Honduran criminal code will continue to apply in these zones, but it will be enforced locally with oversight. There can be a penitentiary system privately run and operated in these zones with oversight. Hondurans are not going to let you create a slave camp, but they're going to trust these foreigners with oversight to run these zones. Basically, the governments will be able to build, be built from the bottom up almost to the very top. They haven't implemented it yet. But when and if that happens, that's going to allow a lot of experiments in government, and it will hopefully reveal to the Hondurans and the world better ways of doing it. Why wouldn't Honduras let you create a slave, a slave camp? Because, I mean, a lot of governments do let people create essentially slave camps. So why are you so confident in a government that is currently in riots, as you said, is going to be really good at making sure that no one creates a slave camp? Well, you know, I've been to Honduras and met a lot of Hondurans and talked with them, and I just say it's not in their culture. I mean, it, I just don't see them creating slave camps. Now, they can do a lot of bad things, for sure. I'm not calling them angels, but, you know, every different culture has its own kind of, you know, downsides, the way it can go wrong. They could do terrible things. But the reason to take your particular, first of all, I just don't think culturally that's going to happen there, but they could do things wrong, and the reason it won't happen is for a number of reasons. One is the whole world is watching. Two, the Hondurans say on paper, and I believe them, they say, you know, you're going to have to obey the Honduran Constitution. And they also say, you're going to have to have a special court of human rights. And if people in your ZEDES, they're called, in these private communities, are, they allege violations of human rights, you're not going to go to a Honduran court, you're not going to go to the local private court, you're going to go to an international court for human rights. So they've, and there's other mechanisms in place. This is a very well thought through system. By, I will credit Octavio Sanchez. He's a Honduran. He grew up there, he's got some, he's just a brilliant man, and I've met him, and he won't take credit, but I'm gonna give him credit for these really innovative reforms. There's also, I'll give you another, there's a, a body called CAMP, the, uh, it's, that's from the Spanish acronym, but it's a Committee for Adoption of Best Practices. It's a body of 21, mostly foreigners, appointed by the president of Honduras, to actually act like a board of trustees for these communities. So there's many layers of oversight and double checking. Does it mean it'll work? I don't know, they haven't done it yet. It's an experiment we're trying. They, in good faith, have tried to, to set up a system where rights will be respected and people can live in peace and generate prosperity. And I think it's worth a try. I won't pretend they have it all figured out, but they're way ahead of everybody else. So then let me ask, I guess, a variant of my, my prior question. Um, these, so what you're describing in Honduras, there are similar things in other parts of the world where government has carved out spaces and said you can use different economic rules here, uh, different fiscal rules here. What's the incentive for governments to do this or allow this in the first place? Because say, if this Honduras experiment works really well, if, if you know, the enthusiasm that you have for these kinds of things ends up being warranted, then isn't that just going to show the people of Honduras that their government wasn't really that great? Like they're just gonna wanna turn the whole country into one of these things. 
which seems like that's a loss for the government. Um, so why why would well, governments in the government, for mean. the people in the government, yeah. right? So why would governments, and especially governments that don't run terribly well to begin with, want to allow these kinds of things? Good question. Um, well, let's use a couple examples. Foreign trade zone. Why did the United States decide, initially they said, we love customs and duties. We get money from that. Why would the federal government back off of that? Because they see other gains. They see that, oh, well, we'll actually come out ahead in tax revenues, maybe, because we'll tax the income of that longshoreman when he goes back home in Corona. Maybe they sat down and ran the numbers. That's possible. In Honduras, there, the problem is getting foreign investment. And Honduras, you know, you gotta be realistic. You work in Honduran government, and I imagine they had conversations a bit like this. Boy, I wish we had more foreign investment. Me too. Why aren't we getting it? Have you looked at our, say, our, our murder rate lately? Yeah, it's pretty bad. <sighs> and our, nobody trusts our government. Why is that? I tell you, everybody I talked to in Honduras, everyone, from the guy in the street to the government official said, this is what they told me, everybody, you can't trust the courts. They'll throw the case to whoever pays them the most money. That's why people won't invest here. This is happening in a government office. They're having a conversation. Well, how do we get that foreign investment? We're going to have to let them do something different. It's not like governments are eager to give up power, but it's really, if you set it up right, a way that the governments themselves see they can come out ahead. We'll have more tax revenue. Ultimately, at the end of the day, we'll have more power by setting aside these small areas where we actually ease up a little bit. Now you might, and you should, ask, well, what happens if that's a big success and it takes over? Some people in government say, that's actually what I want to have happen. I've been trying to reform this government from the inside forever. There's lots of good people in government who want to make it better, and they can't. Because it's hard to change government an inch deep, a mile wide. But when you have an experiment that works, we'll use the Chinese example, Shenzhen. You know, they're literally dying by the millions, tens of millions under Mao. People are eating grass, they're eating each other. Communism doesn't work. They look over the fence at Hong Kong and they go, they have among the highest per capita incomes in the world, and they're just as Chinese as us. Same language, same people, same climate. That is China with what? Better rules. So in Shenzhen, right across the river, they implemented this zone, and it worked, and then it spread throughout the country. Now, maybe someone in, you know, who was a Maoist in China would regret that. But I bet if you talk to people in government in China today, they would say, that was an awesome thing that happened. We actually now have more power. We're able to, we have tax revenues. We can buy a big military. They can do all kinds of stuff. And the Chinese people came out ahead. They were lifted out of abject poverty, from famine, to become basically a lower middle class country. And they're on the way up. And I think we can credit special jurisdictions for that. I'd like to see that happen in America. That's a place where we could learn from the Chinese. If we could have special jurisdictions like the Chinese had them, ones that were big, had population, special rules, we could learn from that. And people in government should welcome that because it'll bring them revenue. And we should welcome it because it'll bring us freedom. You also uh, discuss seasteading in your book, which is not even just using the land that already exists, but making floating islands now. I've seen Waterworld, so I have an idea of what it's like when <laughs> you people don't. live no, on. You don't. And I've Waterworld seen Pirates the of the Caribbean too, which is similar. Uh, <laughs> why? Why wouldn't that be what sea setting is? I mean, so first of all, pirates are a problem in the world's oceans, and I mean, are we really going to build islands and live on them? Does, first of all, does anyone want to live on an island that's like a waterbed all the time? I don't even like waterbeds, so uh, <laughs> maybe that's the biggest problem. But tell us a little about seasteading and then whether or not people will actually live there. Oh, man, Trevor, okay. <laughs> Pirates and a water world and a waterbed. Uh, okay. Well, uh, what do I want to say about that? Uh, I wish I had, I wish the seasteaders had problems with pirates. Right now, we're just trying to get one or two platforms floating in a lagoon in French Polynesia. And we don't need to worry about pirates there. Um, and you also are not going to need to worry about the waterbed effect. We got our engineers working on these platforms. They're big. They're like the size of football fields, and it's going to be in a lagoon, a, a nice lagoon. I've actually gone scuba diving there. It's got coral and everything. It's really nice. Um, yeah, so I wouldn't worry about that. Uh, uh, seasteading, I'd say right now we're taking baby steps towards the ultimate goal, which is being on the open oceans, flying our own flags, and being really free. That's not going to happen tomorrow. Maybe then there'll be pirates, but look, I mean, what's gonna happen if you're on the open ocean and this is your home, you're gonna have some pretty big caliber machine guns if you're worried about pirates. You're gonna- Waterworld, yeah. What, well, <laughs> yeah, they didn't do it very effectively in Waterworld, did they? I mean, I, I, I'm guessing from what I saw at Universal Studios, they have like a Waterworld show there. It looked very violent and explosive. And that's about as credible, frankly, as Waterworld as a source. Anyhow, I, I don't worry much about that, but if you worry about that, I'll say, 
let's revisit this in 15 years. If you're worried about pirates and water world, we're so far from that. Please, let's just try to have a few floating platforms in a lagoon in French Polynesia in a special jurisdiction and see if we can get the, some of the technology ironed out and a little bit of the governance and baby steps. You know, we'll get to that bigger, uh, the bigger issues that come with more freedom later. I hope we do, but right now it's nothing to worry about. So the examples that we've discussed so far of smaller governments or competing governments or startup governments have all been geographical in nature. We're gonna have, we're gonna build an island or we're gonna carve out some a port or some special zone. But is there space to realize the, the, kind of the vision that you articulate in this book in non-geographical ways? Like I'm thinking, does technology enable us to maybe have competing governments or overlapping governments or pick and choose our governments without having to be tied to a particular geographical area? Oh yes, uh, definitely. Um, I think we can look at blockchain technology, Bitcoin, Ethereum, other uh, cryptocurrencies as an example of people non-geographically opting out of um, government monetary systems. That's a very concrete example. There's other examples people are, are trying to make real. For example, using blockchain technology to keep track of uh, title to property. That hasn't been implement, implemented as fully yet as cryptocurrencies, but it's definitely uh, foreseeable. So I'll just say, yes, I don't talk much about that in the book. I got my hands full with geographic jurisdictions, but uh, I think there's a lot of uh, room for growth and freedom in non-geographic special jurisdictions too. You discuss something called ULEX in the book, which I... I think you've drawn a very interesting parallel between open source coding uh -huh. and open source law. And you compare the US code, which is about as impenetrable as, as maybe Apple's you know, un, unattainable backend coding for iOS or something, but the, the US code, the administrative law code, all those things, that's, that's proprietary law. And what we need is open source law. What, what do you mean by that more specifically? I guess the best way to explain this is use an analogy with, with computer uh, science and its history really quickly. So because coding is coding, right? Computer programmers write rules and it tells computers what to do and legislators write rules and it directs what people do. I know people aren't digital chips, but it's an analogy. If you look at the history of computing, they used to write an operating system uniquely for every mainframe they built because every computer was the first one of its type. So they would write an OS for it and then they build another new computer and they write a new OS. These are very simple machines. And then at Bell Labs in 1970, they came up with a very clever idea. Why don't we write an operating system that you can use across computers? And governments are just now getting there. Governments are mostly back in the bad old days of computing. We've got the United States. We write here an OS for the United States. Well, here we're in Canada and we write an OS for Canada and every nation state has its own OS. Most of them. Places like Dubai, Hong Kong kind of imported software from somewhere else. In Dubai, they said the common law of England and Wales will dictate our financial transactions in the Dubai International Financial Center. And that's why you've seen all those skyscrapers go up in the Middle East there. So what Ulex does is it takes that evolution one more step. Computers went from that, from, from operating systems that operate across computers to open source software. You got proprietary software, Microsoft Windows, Apple's OS, but open source software kind of lays open the code and says, here it is. Anybody can read it, anyone can use it and download it, manipulate it. And that's what I've tried to do with Ulex. Collect a bunch of legal rules, lay them out. I'll give you an example. You want to have contract law in your special jurisdiction? You can use the restatement second of contracts. This is put out by the American Law Institute, a private body, not a government body. And it basically sums up the common law of contracts in this really neat little package. And I just took that off the shelf and plugged it into my legal code for contracts. When I needed torts, I used the restatement of torts. When I needed corporate law, I used the Model uh, Commercial Business Association Act, which is the majority rule in the United States. So basically, ULEX tries to do for governments, what open source software like Linux, which by the way, is the most popular OS in the world because it's on your Android phones, Linux has done for computers and smartphones. Do you think that we should eventually take that analogy even further? Because it's not just that open source software projects are, here's the source code, you can look at it and do with what you want, but that the community can then contribute back into yes. the source code. So do you think that we should 
have legal systems where there's mechanisms for people to change them? Should we turn our constitution into a wiki? <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. We should have something. If you know about GitHub, people play around with software on GitHub, and it allows you to have a piece of software, and then people do little branching things. And, well, you know, I don't like this part. I'm going to change this. And then people do variations on that. And it's all documented very carefully, so you always know what version you're using. And yeah, I would like to see that. So I, the idea is I've already got up to version 1.1 of ULEX. So the modifications have already started happening. And I'd love to put it out there and let, you know, maybe Seasteaders say, well, we're going to run ULEX here, but we need a little bit of maritime law. So we're going to do version 1.2 for Seasteads. And someone over here will say, well, we want to set up in a civil law country a ULEX, and we need to have special provisions because we're used to the civil law versus the common law. We're going to do ULEX 1.4. And, you know, they can do that on their own, and I'd love that. And they can adapt it just, just like, just like uh, Linux is adapted for different platforms. Yes, that's exactly how it should go. <clears throat> so we look over, you, you, you want government to be updated, you want rules to get better, you want to be evolutionary, you want to have open source law, you want people to be able to try new things out, have right of exit. Uh, and, and I think a lot of skeptics would look at this and say, Who's going to be doing this? They're going to be corporations and powerful organizations are going to be setting up special economic zones in Honduras or what you call United States special economic zones, possibly throughout the United States, sort of a version of the Honduran one throughout the United States. And a lot of people would say what's going to happen there is basically company towns of 1885. We're going to have, if you, well, that's polycentric law, we're going to have, you're going to go in, you're going to be ruled by, by the company town, the company rules, only shop at the company store, and it will be oppressive because the people will not be adequately represented because they don't really have adequate options uh, in the way that to get exit and all those problems still exist. So what would you say to this idea that you're advocating will ultimately be a more oppressive system? I'd say it's a valid concern. I'm not one of these libertarians who say, well, it's private, it'll be fine. No. I actually have examples in the book. I discussed Fordlandia. It was a project by the Ford Motor Company to create this uh, huge development in, in the Amazon rainforest, a huge private city, utter disaster. Just because private people are running, they're people. They're the same as public servants. They can get things wrong. So valid concern. What should we do about it? Um, first notice it, and then read the book. The whole third section is about practice, and I've worried about this myself, and so I advocate a number of mechanisms to avoid those problems. For example, citizen courts. we got to set these organizations up so even if a corporation is running the town, when you have a fight against the corporation, you don't go to their courts. You have an independent adjudicative body. Freedom of exit. Uh, you need to have, and I... Again, I will say, these are situations, the governments have invited these projects. I'm, I'm not saying get rid of governments. I'm saying work with governments. So, as in Honduras, they're going to be looking over the fence at your ZA saying, what's going on here? You know, if there's a human rights violation, you're going to go to this other court. We're going to have this camp acting as a board of trustees to oversee what you do. You can't have your own criminal code. You can't throw people in jail because they have the wrong religious views. That's not in the Honduran criminal code. It's not a quick answer because it's a hard, complex problem. But I think people of goodwill who are informed can foresee these problems and safeguard against them. And because there'll be lots of experiments going on, if one of them blows up like Fordlandia, we go, whoa, let's not do that again. Let's look at the successes and replicate those. So we talked a lot of theory today. We've talked a lot about examples of some of this theory and practice, but maybe to close, could you tell us, looking forward the next 10 or 20 years, what most excites you in this area? Are there, are there particular projects that you think will turn out really awesome or lead the way? Are there particular changes in what governments are doing? Like what, what just fires you up about the notion of our next governments? Ooh, wow, I could go on and on about that. I, I will say keep your eyes open for the Institute for Competitive Governance. Institute for Competitive Governance. It's a new organization I've started up with some fellow travelers, which aims from an academic point of view to study these phenomena, encourage white papers. Maybe we can work with Cato to do some things. Um, so that's exciting to me as an academic. This is a whole new growth area. Like I said, when I started researching this, it was new to me. It's very exciting. I want other academics, people who disagree with me, please, to get into this and reveal things to me and debate. I think that'd be great. More concretely, what do I foresee happening? I hope the Honduran ZAs will happen. Right now, we're in a tough spot in Honduras. There's a lot of turmoil there. It's not unknown to Honduras, which is why they want these zones. People in Honduras can see the way the rest of the world is run, and they are in anguish about the way their government is run, and they want to do it better. They want a chance to do it better. So hopefully that'll kick in in places like Honduras, 
will be like China. The people in Honduras are really suffering under their government now, government now, like the people in China once did. If we could do for Honduras and other countries who follow their example what happened in China, wow, that would be great. That's very exciting. Seasteading, very exciting. There's a number of reasons I like seasteading. It's kind of cool. It's kind of <laughs> sci-fi. I like the ocean. People love it. They just they get so wrapped up in these images of floating cities. And um, I would like for their dreams to be realized. Uh, I think sometimes they're wildly unrealistic, but I'm sure you can say that about a lot of my work. So that's fine. Um, I'm also interested in uh, some interesting financing models that fellow travelers, I can't say a lot about this yet because we haven't gone public, but fellow travelers and I have been working on allowing for um, the use of, uh, I guess I could say, ICO type funding mechanisms for private governance projects. So to give you an example, the idea would be something like, suppose you find uh, Puerto Rico, that's a place I've been, I've been looking at lately, and you say, oh, they really need some help. If they had a, something like a special economic zone in, in Puerto Rico, it could really help them out a lot. It's gonna take money to do that. Maybe we could raise that money publicly through an ICO process, and if we had a big pool of money, guess what? Things happen when you have money that don't happen when you don't. If you could go to the governments of Puerto Rico and the federal government and say, look at all these people who have money they're willing to put into a special jurisdiction in Puerto Rico. You interested now? That would make things happen. That wasn't available to us in the past. These new models of raising funds can let us tap a lot of people all over the world who would like this for, for both financial and ideological reasons to happen. And money makes things happen. So I want to see that happen too. Free Thoughts is produced by Test Terrible. If you enjoyed today's show, please rate and review us on iTunes. And if you'd like to learn more about libertarianism, find us on the web at www.libertarianism.org.